in the wake of the tragedy in Rwanda, genocide in Rwanda, you said the following, I swore to myself that if I ever faced such a crisis again, I would come down on the side of decisive action, going down in flames if that was required. Right now, we're, I don't know how you would quantify it other than as, as an enormous tragedy, but what's going on in Syria must qualify in some way uh, as a horror, at least. Um, what can we do? What can you do? And what can the administration do? And what can this country do to stop it? It's now been quite a long time. Well, let me begin where you started. And thank you for having me, David. My thank pleasure. Thank you, Philip, for joining. Thank and thank you all for coming. Uh, my only disappointment is that there are french fries in the front row, which is a really <laughs> unfair distraction. <laughs> you know, hide the police. Um, but let me begin with uh, where you started, which was Rwanda. And uh, Philip knows the story uh, inside and out. But the tragedy of Rwanda was that we never discussed or debated uh, at any senior policy level any action uh, to deal with the genocide. Uh, the opposite is the case with Syria. The opposite was the case uh, with Libya, where uh, the decision was taken by President Obama that the United States would join with others in the international community, with partners in Europe, partners from the Arab world, uh, with the support of the Security Council, and protect and save hundreds of thousands of civilians. But when, we, when the President took that decision, some of you may recall uh, in his explanation to the American people that he said, just because we can't intervene everywhere doesn't mean we shouldn't intervene anywhere. And so uh, the decision was taken, and I believe very strongly it was the right one with respect to Libya. With respect to Syria, we're constantly uh, debating and wrestling with the challenge of, of what best to be done. But one of the things we have learned in, in Libya and Syria and various parts of Africa and the Balkans and, and many other places is that each of these circumstances is different. And what the international community can best do to deal with horrific tragedies is not uniform across the board. And military intervention is not always necessarily the wisest course or the most effective course. In the case of Syria, we've attained, what is going on by it's the way? It's called the subway. <laughs> Feels like a, like a yeah. Mack truck is yes. about to come through the. Imagine doing imagine doing Hamlet here, and all of a sudden. <laughs> Sorry. Another distraction. <laughs> um, in the case of Syria, we have done several things from the outset, and we continue to. First of all, obviously, we are the foremost provider of assistance to the Syrian people, both those inside of Syria and those outside that have been forced uh, uh, into being refugees, some $385 million uh, of U.S. assistance. We have led uh, partners in Europe and elsewhere in imposing very tough economic sanctions on uh, the Assad regime, and those sanctions have deprived Assad and, and uh, his government of hard currency and have gradually uh, undermined the economy. Unfortunately, because of the intransigence of Russia and China, there's no near-term prospect of, of having universalized sanctions through the Security Council. Um, we have provided support and assistance to the opposition, both in helping them form and unify politically uh, in recognizing them, them now as the legitimate representative uh, of the Syrian people and providing material support, uh, non-lethal assistance, political support, but also concrete support in terms of medical supplies, mm -hmm. communications equipment, and other sorts of, of uh, resources to help them cohere. Uh, and we are looking at ways of stepping up that assistance, as, as Secretary Kerry uh, announced when he was uh, in Europe a couple weeks ago. And we're looking at, uh, at ways of providing non-lethal support to the armed opposition. But to take me through the, the, the process, the thought process, the policy discussion of the possibility of u the use of, of arms, the possibility of, of military intervention in Syria, and why it was rejected, why it remains rejected, and why for the foreseeable future it seems to be out of question. Well, first of all, all of these options are under constant review uh, and remain so. But the, the view that the United States has taken is that while there may be some countries, and in fact there are some countries that have decided to actively 
uh, arm the Syrian opposition. Uh, from the U.S. point of view, we've chosen not to add to the militarization of the conflict at this stage with lethal aid, uh, but to support the opposition in, in other ways that are tangible, that are important, which taken together, we think will uh, combine to uh, enhance their ability to, to try to get the, to our ultimate goal, David, which is not a military solution to this conflict, Understood. but, but the, a political but the early, solution. The early the discussion, table. and Anne-Marie Slaughter, who worked in, in, in the Secretary of State shop for a long time, talked very openly about no-fly zones, for example, the, the efficacy of those. Why was that rejected? No-fly zones in particular, which was the most vivid possibility of some kind of limited military protection or intervention. Well, first of all, it, it's far from limited in the context of Syria, where the air defense systems are very, very sophisticated, unlike in Libya, where the terrain is very complex, unlike in Libya, uh, and where for a long time, although this is gradually changing, the opposition didn't control substantial swaths of territory on the ground, and thus the value of a no-fly zone uh, was limited in terms of, of changing the balance of forces. That is a factor that has evolved, and so that's one of the things that, that we factor into our assessment and analysis of, of the situation. But, David, our aim remains because Syria is so much more uh, complex and volatile than some other cases. Our aim remains, if, if any way possible, to try to deal with this through a negotiated political settlement. And what we've been trying to do is increase the pressure on the regime, political, economic, and otherwise, such that they make the decision to deal with this through a negotiated settlement. But the, re the fact is that uh, with the sectarian fissures in Syria that are mirrored throughout the region, uh, with the active support of some major external actors for Assad who view his survival as uh, as a significant interest of theirs, i.e. Russia, e. Russia mm -hmm. uh, and indeed Iran, uh, with um, the, uh, the, the nature of the conflict and the, high, the presence of, of now increasing numbers of extremist elements uh, backed by al-Qaeda, this is a very complex and dangerous problem. And while we have a very significant interest in its urgent resolution and Assad's departure and protection for the people of Syria. Uh, it is not as simple a situation or as concrete a black and white a, a situation as we've seen elsewhere. And so, as I've said, the aim has been, from, from the U.S. point of view, strengthen the opposition in ways political and material, um, try to provide a degree of international support and coherence for their efforts with the aim of trying to increase the odds of a negotiated settlement. Philip, you, you were against the intervention in Libya in the first place. Fish. I was skeptical that we, I mean, I, what I said was that as soon as we declared a no-fly zone, there was no option but regime change. That there was no way we could leave that he could stay which meant uh, without, without that essentially being impossible for NATO. And how do you and, look at and it I, and, and obviously, uh, uh, one of the things I'd be curious about, but one certainly gets the impression that the Russians, uh, in giving their sanction to the action in, in Libya uh, through the Security Council, uh, did not anticipate the NATO war that followed uh, and the regime change and the sort of basically NATO flying as the air force of this rebel movement out of Benghazi as it moved uh, west across the country and uh, the U.S., but primarily the French and others helping to coordinate that political movement. And, and there's at least been the impression, and I, I'm not in the councils that you're in and the corridors that you're in, but there's the impression that, um, that they sort of said, like, we've been played and betrayed. Uh, we were asked to give uh, more than we've ever given before by way of permission. And uh, we gave an inch and you took a mile or 10 miles or 100 miles. And uh, we're not going to let that happen again. And I don't know how much that's the case or how much it's very specifically their client in Syria. But I also have seen, I know that when there was the Camp David meeting or, uh, a while back um, about Syria, uh, was it G8? Maybe it wasn't Camp David meeting, but it was, I think it was the, the G8 yeah, uh, right. summit, that there was... Uh, I think it was Lavrov, the Russian, who said, uh, very, or somebody speaking for him, who said basically, you know, nobody who's calling for intervention, uh, international intervention, can say what they want it to look like when it's over. They can't tell you who they want to see there. They can't tell you what should be in charge. And obviously, we took a big gamble on that in Libya with mixed results. 
and blow back in Mali and elsewhere. And I, uh, my sense is that that's a serious constraint as well, that there isn't a scenario at this stage. Which leads to the question, that how, does, do how we, do you think this ends? Do we have something serious? that we want to see? Other than a negotiated settlement sounds still a little vague. Like, we're not sure what we want to see out of the elements that are there. I think we know what we'd like to see. Uh, the question is, how feasible is it uh, and how achievable is it? Well, this, this, let's recall how this began. This began as a peaceful uprising by the Syrian people who wanted uh, the yoke of the, the, the decades of Assad repression lifted. Right. Uh, and the government responded with brutal force. And out of that evolved uh, a, a, a civil conflict and, and that was also uh, partially hijacked by an extremist insurgency. But the bulk of the opposition remain uh, Syrians who, who want to achieve the original objective that the people came into the streets for, which is a government that they get to choose of their own uh, volition and that, that is legitimate. So that still remains the desired end state. And, and, and I think that you know, if you ask the majority of, of Syrian people, they, they would embrace that. But that you know, is best achieved not through the barrel of a gun in a war that is you know, extending with real spillover consequences through countries in the region. But ideally, if possible, as I said, through a negotiated settlement. But that involves Assad being persuaded that he can't be part of that future. And is there and any way to persuade him of that? And government elements uh, that don't have blood on their hands negotiating with opposition elements on a transitional arrangement, which is what we agreed in Geneva uh, about a year ago, not quite a year ago, last summer, um, with the Russians and other members of the Security Council. Uh, I, do, I do think it's, at this point, uh, it, it's not impossible, but it's becoming more and more difficult to achieve. And the hope had been, and remains, uh, that, the, uh, that the pressure would build on Assad, both from his supporters and uh, from the opposition, such that he calculates uh, that ultimately the better outcome is, is not to fight to the bitter end. But I want to come back to something you said about the Russians, because you did a, no offense, a very good job of summarizing their narrative about Libya and Syria. But I also think, frankly, it's uh, a Karevich is a Russian a manufactured yeah. narrative. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the Russians knew exactly uh, what well, it's the hard security, to imagine why they, they knew exactly what the I mean. Security Council was agreeing to uh, when we voted for Libya, because we discussed it very openly, very concretely, in great depth. Not re regime change. But what we discussed was that the, uh, the coalition that this resolution that uh, we um, co-sponsored was to authorize was going to have the authority and the ability to use military force, including targeted and, and sustained airstrikes, to, to beat back the, uh, the Libyan military as it continued its march against the, the population, initially in Benghazi and, and subsequently beyond. They knew exactly what it entailed. And I think that their acquiescence in it, they didn't vote for it, but they abstained, uh, was uh, not a function of uh, the fact that they were duped. It was a function of the fact that at that stage, nobody on the Security Council, not even the Russians or the Chinese, uh, had a brief for Muammar Gaddafi. Everybody had, had a belly full of him, and nobody was prepared to own the saving of him. Uh, and also, and we'll, we'll never know this for, for sure, but uh, I, you know, I, I wonder if the, the Russians thought that you know, this was you know, not something they had any interest in blocking, but uh, you know, if, the, if the United States and the Arab countries and the, and the NATO countries wanted to uh, engage in another entanglement in the region that they thought had entangled us in the past, then they were not going Find to stand that. in the way. But Syria is a very different case. In Syria, the Russians uh, have a long-standing relationship with Assad. They have military and intelligence facilities. Uh, and they lost a lot of ground in the region uh, in the context of Arab Spring. And this is their, uh, their big remaining their stronghold. Bul their bulwark. Now, it, uh, on the question of Iran, nu in, in the nuclear question surrounding Iran, the president has said repeatedly, all options are on the table. It's no, there's no question about what that's meant to mean to all concern, both to signal to Israel, to signal to Tehran, to signal to the, the, I think the populace that's probably absorbed this reality the least is probably the one here. And that it seems to me from reading the progress of the Iranian nuclear program, uh, that the Iranians themselves are signaling all the time a certain progress. 
uh, and a certain dis distaste for uh, the, the negotiations that they're involved with. And sooner or later, there's going to be a reckoning with, with the all options are on the table question. Um, is the United States really prepared to bomb Iranian nuclear facilities, uh, considering what the ramifications in the region were, are likely to be, and considering what the region has become in, in recent times? Well, let me reiterate what you've heard the President and, and many others say. The U.S. policy and our commitment is to prevent Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Not to contain Iran with a nuclear weapon, but to prevent it from acquiring a nuclear weapon. Uh, our preferred means of accomplishing that has been through what we've called a dual track policy with the other members of the uh, permanent uh, five of the Security Council, Russia, China, the United States, France, Britain, plus Germany, P5 plus one, um, through pressure and diplomacy. Uh, with respect to pressure, we have adopted in the UN Security Council back in 2010 uh, the latest in a series of the toughest sanctions uh, that have been imposed on Iran. And we've combined those with uh, a series of, of unilateral measures from the United States, from the Europeans, from the Asians, from countries in the region that have now squeezed the Iranian uh, nuclear program and its economy uh, to unprecedented levels. Uh, its oil exports are way down. Its hard currency uh, is way down. Its economy is now really feeling uh, the force of these sanctions and will continue to feel it more uh, in coming months. This pressure is designed not as an end in itself, but to change their calculus at the negotiating table. We've had various rounds of, of discussions, including most recently a couple of weeks ago. That round of discussions that took place in, in Kazakhstan was actually rather useful. Uh, and we will be having more later this month and uh, early next month. The aim is to, uh, to persuade the Iranians to halt their nuclear program in a verifiable fashion, roll it back, such that uh, what they claim they want, which is a peaceful nuclear program, is, is verified and there's no opportunity for them to break out into a nuclear uh, and military program. No, I get that, but does, 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 their, does, does your intelligence show you that, that they've done anything to actually roll it back? Do, 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 does our intelligence show us that, in fact, Iran is so affected by these sanctions that the, the, the likelihood of our not having to use uh, military intervention, which is, seems to be what's promised from the White House, that, that that's that's very likely. Well, I'm not going to talk about what our intelligence says, but I will say. Uh, How about that, what the New York Times says? Uh, well, <laughs> which is much are you the same. equating the two? No comment. Uh, that's my that's my intelligence. <laughs> Debatable, but yeah. anyway. Uh, <laughs> The, the information that we have is quite clear that these sanctions are having a very significant uh, economic impact on, uh, on the Iranian economy. Uh, and that is beginning to cause debate and discussion uh, within the senior leadership uh, and, and within the broader society about the, the, the costs of, of pursuing the course that they're on. Now, it hasn't led them to date uh, to abandon their nuclear program, and it hasn't uh, yielded uh, an irreversible breakthrough in the negotiations. But our view is that there is still time and space for diplomacy and pressure. That's not an infinite window, uh, and indeed it's, it, it, it is shortening uh, with, as time passes. But the fact remains that there is still an opportunity. The pressure is building. Um, we know it is, is not, uh, not going unnoticed uh, mm -hmm. uh, within the leadership in, in Tehran. And uh, indeed, the, the, the negotiation process uh, is potentially uh, gaining a little bit of traction. So we'll see. But the president's been clear. We aren't taking options off the table. But the use of, uh, use of force is an option. But it is not the desired option, nor is it a foregone option by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, the thought of that, of course, gives all of us the jitters, uh, this, this, this notion of a complete conflagration in an area that we're trying right now to draw down from. And then I look at Syria, and I see Syria as, you know, when we talk about action in Syria, it, the, the temptation to do something in the face of what we're witnessing is obviously great. 
but it seems that uh, the risk of provoking something much greater, and I'm wondering how much uh, the thinking about Syria is driven by the thinking about Iran. I mean, is, it, I assume that Iran, preventing Iran from having that nuclear weapon, is the highest priority when you're looking at that little constellation of interrelated uh, crises, uh, not, or huge constellation, and, and, that, and that to some extent that has to be the primary set of calculations. But I don't know how much they, they run across each other, and I wonder if you can say anything about that. Well, clearly, preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon is a very high U.S. and international priority. And one of the things that has been accomplished over the last few years is that you know, the international community is more united than ever in its determination to prevent Iran from having a nuclear weapon, including China and Russia and the other mm -hmm. members of this P5 plus one. And the sanctions are uh, at a level that are, that are truly unprecedented. And the and it's an diplomatic and, and efforts And it can't are, be a containment situation. The, the policy is anti, it, it says that containment is not the policy. That is U.S. policy. I containment is why, not. Why is that? Because uh, the United States view is, and in fact the view of our allies and partners uh, in the region and internationally is that a nuclear armed Iran, uh, should that uh, uh, come to pass, would pose a grave threat uh, not only to countries in the region but to the entire uh, peace and stability of, of, uh, is that of the international of our experience community. With North Korea? It's beyond that. It, it, these are separate, but, but uh, th this is a different case. In Iran, you, know, you have a government that's threatened to wipe another country off the face of the map, uh, Israel. Uh, you have uh, the potential for a nuclear Iran to unleash uh, a, a race by other countries in the region to acquire uh, a similar capability. It's highly destabilizing for all of the reasons that we've discussed. Now, North Korea is also a problem, uh, but of a different sort. I mean, we can certainly talk about that. But it's not, Iran is not a problem because of North Korea. Iran is a, is a problem in its own right. And so, yes, we have certainly prioritized preventing Iran from acquiring a nuclear weapon. But that is not uh, at the expense of our interests in Syria, our interests in, in the democratic transformations in uh, the region, which are, are fraught and, and fragile. It's not uh, at the expense of our enduring interest in a, a negotiated settlement uh, between Israel and the Palestinians and a two-state solution. Mm -hmm. we, gotta have, we, we have to deal with all these, uh, these challenges uh, let me ask a, Let me ask a question about two-state solution, and then I know Philip wants to talk about Africa in a second. I get the feeling from talking to people in the administration. The fries? They did finish the French fries. <laughs> Empty out the thing so we can see. There's some more. Would you like some? No. I would, but I, I won't. Somehow, weirdly, the subway stopped. Yeah. We won't even pause over that. Um, I get the feeling from talking to people in the administration that the White House looks at a government in Israel and sees division, weakness. We don't get along with them terribly well on a personal level, but that's really immaterial. A divided polity in, in Palestine and the feeling that we have only limited political capital for any number of issues, domestic and foreign. There is no way we're going to spend the next four years spending any of that capital trying yet again to create a two-state solution. And at the same time, there's a knowledge that time is fleeting, that the opportunity for a two-state solution is not forever. What's your view of it? Well, first of all, I think it is clearly uh, it has been for many years and remains very much in the interest of the United States. And we believe in the interests of Israel and the Palestinians that there be a two-state solution. And it remains our policy to work to try to accomplish that. Now, there's no question that it's difficult and that there are political headwinds on, coming from many different uh, directions. But uh, this is something that the United States and President Obama remains committed to, and it's something that we will continue to work on but through the course of the second Remaining term. committed to it is one thing. Spending enormous political capital and taking a chance and proposing a plan and bringing people together and trying in a very serious way is quite another. Are we prepared to do the latter, not just be committed to the ideal of a two-state solution? Well, it's not just being committed to the ideal. It, it's about rolling up our sleeves and doing what we can to, to bring it about. But, uh, you know, the president will be going uh, to the region in, uh, next week, in fact. Right. Uh, and while he is not going with a, a Middle East initiative or to He's not. pursue... He's no. Or to why, pursue... And why not? Can I... Let me explain yeah. why not. <laughs> 
or to pursue any single issue in depth. It is an opportunity for us to engage with the Israelis, with the Palestinians, and, and uh, indeed the, uh, the Jordanians on uh, the full range of issues that are on our shared agenda, including Syria, including Iran, and of course including uh, the prospects for uh, supporting and, and promoting a two-state solution. It would be, I think, premature and presumptuous uh, for the, the president to, to show up in the region with a peace plan that, without the benefit of having the opportunity to sit down and discuss and hear from those most concerned how they see the situation, where they see the opportunities, um, and, and how U.S. leadership in the current context can be most effective. But uh, that doesn't, that doesn't, is not to suggest that, that such a thing might never happen. It depends on uh, whether we think the circumstances are ripe and, and whether that kind of U.S. initiative, we, we have a reasonable expectation, would yield the desired result. I mean, if I can switch for a second to back to the, the, the lar this question of intervention and, the, and your and the administration's view of it um, as it's evolved really since Rwanda and since the sort of we mustn't be taken uh, uh, just sitting by in the, in the future. It always seemed to me that there was a very strong feeling in the Clinton administration of regret after Rwanda and of, of we must uh, take this to heart but that it got applied to Kosovo, it got applied to thinking about East Timor, it got applied to a lot of places, but not to Africa, because the compelling national interests and the compelling strategic interests, and the, it always comes down to some sort of notion that, oh, this is just humanitarian. It's, it's not just, it's not a mixture of humanitarian and political, there's not a strategic interest, so you saw Darfur, and we stood uh, at the edges of it. We did a little bit, but there was not going to be that. We saw Congo in a terrible crisis for most of the last decade. Uh, we were very hands-off about that. Um, and I've always wondered whether, I mean, we saw Liberia, now this was obviously not uh, during the uh, Demo during a Democratic administration, but it seems... Nor was Darfur. Uh, no, it wasn't, but there wasn't a completely clear call one way or the other. And I'm not saying that, by the way, that I say that this should be, but I'm trying to understand what the thinking is and how it's looked at. Uh, that there seems to be this very strong kind of notion that we mustn't let these things happen, but when they do, they're complicated and we are overextended and uh, they don't imperil us for the most part. Um, and so what is our interest when we see uh, great suffering in uh, a protracted war in Congo? Uh, which is going on certainly uh, throughout the last decade. Well, you, you ended with Congo, but you started with the broader picture. Yeah. And, I, and I think so it's, it's um, important to, to understand that from the U.S. point of view, and I think, l let me say, while I can't speak for administrations that I didn't serve in, I do think there's a fair degree of continuity in policy uh, over the last 20 plus years uh, on, a, on a bipartisan basis when it comes to Africa. And I think from a U.S. point of view in Africa, our interests are not purely humanitarian. Uh, that's a piece of it, an important piece. But they're strategic, they're economic, uh, they're very much from a security vantage point, which is uh, manifest in places ranging from Mali today to Somalia uh, yesterday mm -hmm. and today uh, to uh, various other uh, parts of uh, East, West Africa, and indeed the Sahel region. So uh, it, it, it is not uh, as simple as, you know, humanitarian or nothing. It's all of the above. Uh, our trade and investment relationship with Africa is significant and growing. It is actually a major source of oil and other resources uh, for the United States. But it is also a long-term potential market uh, for trade and investment with the United States. So it's viewed through all of those prisms simultaneously. Um, but I think what has happened in Africa, to an extent that, frankly, we haven't seen uh, in the Middle East, uh, and indeed in, in other regions of the world, is that the countries of the continent have come together uh, through their own mechanisms, uh, most recently through the establishment of the African Union, but through sub-regional entities, what we know as ECOWAS, the Economic Community of West African States in the West, the EGAD countries is a, the... Uh, East African uh, collection of countries in, in the Horn, and they have taken leadership responsibility for dealing with these uh, crises and conflicts by deploying forces. And then they have sought from the United States and the United Nations and other Western countries the financial and logistical and uh, sometimes intelligence support to en enable those operations. That's what's happened in Somalia with rather sub substantial success. 
That's what's begun uh, in Mali in combination uh, with the French. In Cote d'Ivoire, where we had a genuine humanitarian intervention and the restoration of democracy under UN auspices, it was principally an African led force, but a blue helmeted uh, UN force. In Congo, the UN has a large uh, peacekeeping presence that, that has uh, not been as effective as, as one would want or hope. But again, the leadership there, as we've just seen in resolving the latest round of uh, violence and insurgency in Eastern Congo, has come as much from the, the countries in the neighborhood uh, backed up by the United Nations as it has from outside. So what, the, what our African partners are seeking uh, and, and increasingly demanding is not externally imposed solutions or external interventions, but support for their efforts uh, to, to stabilize uh, and, um, and, and counter security threats, whether it's you know, threats as in Somalia, which are extremist threats, or as in Mali, uh, or whether their protection of civilians challenges, as in Darfur, where, as you know, it was the African Union that first deployed forces to protect civilians, followed by the United Nations, uh, which um, actually has had uh, a, a more salutary impact. There's also, obviously, and I mean, it's, you're right, absolutely right to say one shouldn't be talking about it in an aggregate as Africa, but in these specific situations. But there is also this coming together, as you describe. And I'm wondering about the, the American policy to the extent that it's articulated, sort of what are we looking for in Africa? And you have President Obama go and gives his speech in, in Ghana. We, democracy, democracy. And that's been very much the talking point that I've heard over and over uh, during the last uh, four or five years from Johnny Carson, the Assistant Secretary of State for Africa. And yet, uh, in, in significant places in Africa, uh, that's not, uh, it doesn't exist in the way that one would like to see it. And yet there can be development without democracy. Uh, there are leaders who have very mixed records on human rights and very strong records on development, like uh, Paul Kagame in Rwanda, like uh, in Ethiopia uh, with uh, ISIS. And now you have a situation. Uh, Melis. Melis, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> that, right. That's a big exactly. <laughs> And uh, you also have now a situation where you have the United States uh, sort of looking at the Kenya election and saying, you know, democracy, very, 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 very important to us, but there are consequences to the choices that you make. We sent a very strong message discouraging them from electing the uh, person who was indicted uh, by the ICC or under indictment from the ICC as a suspect. And it seems like if we had any influence, it might have been, if anything, to help him get elected uh, by, by getting their back up, by getting his supporters back up. And I, I wonder how you feel that message really is getting conveyed, how uh, much we have influence in, the, in, in sort of pushing democratization rather than assisting or watching what's happening, why we find ourselves siding with the ICC, a court that we don't subscribe to, and, and then look hypocritical for saying you must submit to it, though we don't. Um, how, do, how, do, how, does, how do those okay. decisions get it's made? a lot of stuff in there. Yeah. For, for, <laughs> First of all, our interests in Africa are multiple. Right. Yes, we have an interest, as we do everywhere in the world, in, in promoting and sustaining democracy and respect for human rights. That is a bedrock element of our approach, not just to Africa, but to, to every other part of the world, from uh, Middle East to Asia to Latin America uh, and elsewhere. But it's not uh, the sum total uh, of our interest or our objective. We very much seek economic development, uh, and through economic development, the, the, uh, the lifting of, of living standards, which is why the United States under President Obama has had such a, an active and, and significant investment in food security and agriculture and livelihoods in Africa. Uh, we have an interest in the health and well-being of the African people, their education uh, and, and, and their, um, their, uh, their, their physical well-being, which is why the President has built on uh, the initiative that President Bush uh, started with respect to AIDS in Africa, known as PEPFAR, but built it into a global health initiative that goes beyond uh, treatment of a single disease while including that, but building health infrastructure and capacity in Africa to deal with long-standing health challenges. So we have a multifaceted interest and approach. It's not simply uh, democracy, as important as that is, not simply human rights, as important as that is. It's also economic development. It's also peace and security. Uh, and we have counterterrorism interests and concerns. We have, as I mentioned earlier, economic interests and concerns, and, and thus uh, the, the promotion of trade and investment between the United States and Africa that benefits both 
uh, sides of the uh, Atlantic. So all of these are interests that we have to promote and, and, and balance simultaneously, which is what makes policymaking both interesting and difficult, uh, because sometimes these are in conflict. And you mentioned uh, some significant examples. You mentioned Rwanda. Rwanda is a case where, as you've written so eloquently, 20, almost 20 years, 19 years after the genocide, uh, Rwanda is a place which is, in, by many standards, an economic development model. And yet it is not democratic. It's got a bad human rights record uh, and a record of, of political insularity. And it's been uh, unhelpfully and negatively involved in, in Congo and, and, and elsewhere in the region. So there, there are pluses and minuses. Yet, on the other hand, Rwanda has been a, a net positive contributor to UN peacekeeping. It's doing more to prevent uh, atrocities in Darfur than arguably uh, any other country. Um, so it's, it, it's complicated. And we have to balance both our interest in their security and development with our grave concerns about their lack of democratization and human rights violations. Um, you, uh, you, can look, you looked at Kenya. Uh, first of all, I, I want to take a little bit of uh, uh, exception to your characterization of our policy. I think the best articulation of U.S. policy was, in fact, President Obama's video message right. to the Kenyan people, uh, in which uh, he very clearly said, we respect the will of the Kenyan people, and we have reiterated that uh, over recent days as they have made their choice at least uh, thus far at the polls. We've stressed the importance of them uh, conducting the elections peacefully without the violence of the last round. And so far, knock on wood, uh, that's, that's happened. Right. And we've also said that to the extent that there are questions and issues and challenges, that they ought to be done in a legal fashion uh, through the established legal processes. Um, the United States has a, uh, a very long history of friendship and partnership with Kenya going back to their independence in 1963. And we have every interest uh, in seeing that sustained. And we do have to respect uh, the, the will of the Kenyan people as, as they make their choice, provided it was that their choice has been legitimately reflected in the outcome. Because, I mean, that, that question obviously comes up not just there, but one saw it also in Egypt when, when you exactly. have, uh, but even there you have a more complicated one, which is a, pr a professedly anti-democratic candidate being democratically elected and uh, us trying to position ourselves. And, uh, and by the way, that's not only a, a challenge in sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. We've seen that in sure. some other parts of the world. Yes, sir, I want to ask you a personal question. Um, person? <laughs> not that person. Um, what do you, when you, you've been a student of diplomacy and a, a diplomat and in the world of politics for quite a while, who's your model? And a certain Philip Gurevich described you once as a half-realist, half-idealist. This was in the midst of the unpleasantness um, around the Secretary of State question. And um, I'd I just like to know, in, in, in diplomatic terms, in terms of intellectual models, do you have anyone? It, it's, it seems at this point, uh, Ryan Lizza, for example, spent months trying to figure out and write a long piece for The New Yorker about uh, President Obama's ideology, foreign policy ideology. And it was, the answer was quite fuzzy. And so I, I'd love to get a firmer view of how you see models for diplomatic thinking and what our, own, what our world view is or what President Obama's world view that you're charged with, with, with reflecting at the United Nations is. Well, first of all, I, I won't try to uh, speak for anybody other than myself. But I, uh, I don't have a single model. Uh, you know, there are many people who have been uh, friends and mentors and, and, and uh, have taught me important lessons along the way. Um, but uh, I, I, to be very candid, you know, the people that have influenced me the most are, are my parents. Mm -hmm. uh, my late father and my mother who, uh, you know, taught me the, the value of, of hard work, of, of integrity, of always trying to do my best. And they, uh, they had very accomplished careers mm -hmm. uh, coming from varying degrees of, of challenging circumstances. It, it's their model that has inspired me most. But there's, there's a myriad of, of things that one can learn from, from any number of senior people. But do you think that the, the, think the idealist, work? realist business is a dead, I, I, dead model? I, I think it's much, it's, it's not, uh, it's rarely either or 
in the current sure. context. I mean, I, that, and I, you know, I, I, I actually kind of appreciated that characterization, but I would put it somewhat differently. I, I, I would view myself as, as quite pragmatic, but I hope uh, as often as possible very principled in that pragmatism as well. I don't see them as, uh, as in conflict, and I very much believe, particularly in the current context, that uh, our interests, U.S. interests, uh, are most often served by uh, a strong defense of our values. Um, and when we look at, the, for example, the, the revolutions that have occurred uh, in, in the Arab Spring countries, so to speak, um, you know, there were some who said, you know, realism would lead us to, to stick with the old standby uh, autocratic leaders that, uh, that, that have been our long-standing mm -hmm. allies and that idealism would have us, you know, supporting the protesters in Tahrir Square. Well, first of all, the fallacy in that is that the United States gets to pick. Uh, at the end of the day, what transpired in those countries was organic and, and arguably inevitable, and the United States wasn't in a position to you know, keep Mubarak or throw him under the bus. That was to be uh, a, a choice that the Egyptian people made. But the, the decision that President Obama made, which I very much agree with, is that it is in the United States' interest over the long term to support the democratic aspirations of people uh, in the Arab world, just as it is in Africa or any other part of the world. And while that may Come yield, may. while that may yield outcomes uh, that we are sometimes uncomfortable with, and, and in the case of the Arab Spring, this is you know this is going to be complex and messy uh, for years to come. At the end of the day, the United States is better served by countries that are representative of the will of their people. Uh, and we know all the reasons why democratic governments are better partners uh, than their alternatives. But we've got to be willing to mean it when we say that, whether it's in Egypt or Kenya or, or, or any other place. Or Gaza. Or, or Bahrain. any other place. <laughs> or Bahrain. Or Bahrain. Everybody, thank you for coming. Thank you, thank Ambassador you. Rice. Thank you, Philip.